reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This evening, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, which obviously follows 1 Samuel. And it continues the life of David, who is now going to become a king. He was anointed by Samuel to be king over Israel at the command of God when he was only about 12 or 13 years old. And he had to wait a long, long time for it to be fulfilled. When God gives you a promise, he doesn't always deliver the next day, does he? And so he had to wait. Uh, he was understudying Saul. He was ministering to Saul uh, as a musician, learning his skills in playing music and writing the psalms we love today. And um, he uh, was being chased by Saul, who wanted to kill David because of jealousy, knowing that David would succeed him. And now uh, Saul is dead. He's He's died at his own hand because the Philistines were overcoming him and his sons, including Jonathan, best friend to David. And now uh, they're gone, and David is going to become king of Judah, the kingdom to the south, and then he's going to become king of all Israel. Uh, one of the lessons there is to wait upon the Lord. When God makes a promise in your life, wait for it. Wait for it. And if he hasn't made a promise, don't try to make it happen. I've seen people who have a promise from God, but they get impatient. One thing I've also learned, too, that when God gives you a promise, Satan knows about that promise, and oh, he's happy to bring the counterfeit before the genuine. So wait for the genuine. In my case, as you know, the Lord gave me a promise in 1983 that I would be married, among other things that he told me in a sevenfold prophecy, and all came to pass relatively quickly, uh, at least five parts of it did, leaving the law practice, setting up a ministry, etc. But the last part about a wife uh, didn't happen for a year or two or 10 or 20 or 30 years. 31 years later, it came to pass as the lovely Kelly became my wife. Um, but there were counterfeit attempts by Satan and uh, others to uh, try to undo the work of God even had a church split. I always forget about this one. I had a church split because a young lady had felt from God that she was to marry me and I didn't feel it, but she was very persuasive and got about 17 people, including two elders, to leave the church because they couldn't trust a pastor who could not hear from God. So um, we had to, to, had to say goodbye to them, lovely people, but they said, Jerry, you're not anointed because God has spoken you're supposed to marry so-and-so. I said, but he hadn't told me about it. And uh, well, we've got to leave you and go to somebody else. Well, they all repented later on, but it was too late. The damage was done. In any event, you wait. You wait for it. The reverse is also a true. I know people who have not heard from God, but they've heard from themselves and their grandmother, and they want it to happen. And they push, and they shove, and they chisel to get that square peg into a round hole, and it's not of God. If God hasn't called you to it, he's not in it, and just avoid it and wait for him to give you what he has for you. So finally, it's going to come to pass. This will cover roughly 1010 to 971 BC. It's going to record David's ascension to the throne. Uh, we see his sins of adultery, of murder, the terrible consequences of those sins on his family and his nation. David's life is like that of all of us. David is a sinner saved by grace. He does things that are wrong, does a lot of things that are right, loves God. That's the key thing. He worships God from his heart. And when you are hurting, you, you go to his Psalms and you'll find comfort, as you will perhaps nowhere else in the Bible, except Leviticus. <laughs> no, <laughs> not likely. In any event, Psalms are such an encouragement to us, aren't they? Help us, Lord, to understand your word and be encouraged as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Second Samuel, 
Let's begin with chapter 1, as David is going to lament the defeat of Israel at the hands of the Philistines. He mourns over the deaths of Saul and Jonathan and the defeat of the nation of Israel. Again, he's not even a king at this point. He uh, executes Saul's murderer, and then he writes the Song of the Bow, uh, extolling the deeds of Saul and Jonathan. Uh, we're going to see here that, you know, it's healthy to mourn and to honor those who have passed. Um, funerals are very, very important. Uh, memorial services are very important. Uh, not for the deceased, obviously. They've already gone up or down. They've gone. But uh, for those who are left behind, it's important for them to be able to have closure. You've all been to services, graveside services, where they have all been given a flower and you lay it on the casket as kind of a symbolic saying, identify with you, or you touch the casket as you leave. Uh, it helps to bring closure to it. Uh, and then you visit the, way, the website. Or maybe it's uh, cremation and the ashes are sprinkled, or whatever the particular method is chosen. But uh, it's important for us to be able to, to mourn and to honor and to learn lessons uh, of the life of the deceased. So let's begin now with 2 Samuel chapter 1. It came to pass after the death of Saul when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites and David had stayed two days in Ziklag. On the third day, behold, it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. Now David had returned from the Philistines. He had to go to, to them for protection because Saul was trying to kill him in Israel. But then he left and came back to Israel, uh, found that the Amalekites had come and destroyed his village, taken his wives and belongings and those of his men. And so he went after them and destroyed uh, most of the Amalekites at that point. And uh, now this man is coming in, his clothes are torn, his dust is on his head. And David said to him, where have you come from? He said, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. Then David said to him, how did the matter go? Please tell me. He said, the people have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. So this is going to be a firsthand witness of the death of Saul and Jonathan. David doesn't know anything about the details of it. And this is very important for him to find out what happened. So David said to the young man who told him, how do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? Then the young man who told him, said, as I happened by chance to be on Mount Gilboa, there was Saul leaning on his spear, and indeed the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. Now when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me, and I answered him, here I am. And he said to me, who are you? And I answered, I'm an Amalekite. He said to me again, please stand over me and kill me, for my anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and killed him because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. So this is a firsthand account being given to David about the death of Saul. Now we saw in our study the tragic end of the preceding chapter about Saul and the, the battle, verse uh, 3 of chapter 31, the archers hit him. He was severely wounded by the archers. Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword, thrust me through with it, lest the uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But the armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. So according to that account... Saul killed himself, and the armor bearer saw he was dead, and then he killed himself. Now this account comes that Saul was perhaps near death, but he wanted the Amalekite to finish him off, and the Amalekite did that. Which story is true? David's hearing this story from the Amalekite. He doesn't know the preceding story we just told about Saul falling out. He's trying to deduce what's going on here. So he's going to do something very important. He's going to take time. He's going to hear the story. And he's going to take some time. You know, we hear conflicting reports all day long in the news. Uh, you get uh, conflicting reports from one party and then the other party, one individual and another one. Who's telling the truth? We talk about fake news. We talk about true news. 
Actually, it's all fake news except for the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? I don't care what it is otherwise. But we get all sorts of different accounts. And uh, a lot of it's sensationalism. So David was, is hearing this story about the Amalekites saying, I killed him because he wanted me to, and he was near death. So David, in verse 11, took hold of his own clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. They mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. Now, he loved Saul, but Saul hated him. Makes no difference. He still loved him. He still mourned for him. He certainly loved Jonathan and mourned for him. David said to the young man who told him, where are you from? And he said, I am the son of an alien and a Malachite. Remember how Saul refused to kill all the Amalekites? He spared King Agag. The lesson being there that when you don't put something to death that's trying to destroy you, it will destroy you. That addiction, that habit, that trait of character, put it to death before it destroys you. So here's an Amalekite who says, I'm the one who killed him. So David said to him, how was it you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Remember on two occasions, David had a chance to kill Saul when Saul was chasing him. And he uh, passed on that and said, I will not do that. He cut off the corner of his robe one time. Another time took his spear and his flask, but he would not touch the anointed of God. You don't like a certain politician in office or a certain judge or a certain boss uh, or a certain pastor. Uh, you have the right to have your opinion and pray for that individual. You have a right to leave and if it's a question of a job or a church or what have you, but you have no right to try to take somebody down. And so here we find that David had a great respect for authority. And David called one of the young men and said, go near and execute him. And he struck him so that he died. So David said to him, your blood is on your own head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Does that seem harsh? Well, if you take the position that the Amalekite was a good guy, that he told the truth, that he just simply wanted to make sure that the crown and the bracelet didn't get into the wrong hands by the Philistines, and he wanted to help David get a head start because David had that anointing on him, it could be a good deed. Why kill a man for a good deed? But I think David's suspicious of the story, and uh, he knows that he has touched the anointed of God, and he feels that this is not the right thing to do, and so he takes the life of this young Amalekite, which incidentally is what God told Saul to do through Samuel, kill all the Amalekites because they have killed you and they will take you down in the end. So David is probably hearing from the Lord on this and in any event the young man is uh, perhaps has done this to get favor with David. We don't know what his motive was, but David is suspicious of it, feels it wasn't right, and in any event, he touched the anointing of God. So now he's going to lament, and he's going to write a song over Saul and Jonathan. Now, he loved Jonathan, but he also loved Saul, who was trying to persecute him. He's able to differentiate between his love for Saul and Saul's hatred for him. That's a very difficult thing to do. Do I love somebody who hates me? Do I want to help somebody who wants to hurt me? Do I want to make somebody's way straight who wants to make my life miserable and crooked? That's a tall order, isn't it? So he writes this wonderful song uh, and says, teach it to the children of Judah. It's called the Song of the Bow, referring to the bow and arrow of the uh, soldiers. The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. So don't tell the Philistines about this story, about the great, the great ones who are falling here. He says, O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew nor rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, for the shield of the mighty is cast away there. That's where they died. The shield of Saul, not anointed with oil, from the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul did not return empty. So they slayed their, uh, they slew their people too. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. 
And so he's able to extol them. We do the same thing at our memorial services as we talk about the good of those who have departed. We don't mention the bad, do we? We talk about the good, because there's always something good to say about the one who has departed. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. He's able to say that even though he was chasing David and wanted to kill him, he was good for the economy. They did well under his reign. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I'm distressed for you, O oh, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. So he was close to Jonathan in particular. There have been those who have dirty minds who are wondering, what's that mean? Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. It doesn't mean that he was homosexual, far from it. And there are eight wives and three concubines who will testify to the contrary. But there was such a closeness. Those who've been in the battle and in war, those who have been through difficult circumstances know that men with men and women with women can have a close bond. Uh, closer than sisters in some cases. It doesn't mean it's sexual, it just means you're very close and you love each other. There's love of different sorts. It doesn't have to always be sexual. It can also be one of uh, empathy and of, of, of comradeship. They were together. Jonathan was his defender. Kept him alive from uh, King Saul. What, what, a, what a great love. And so perhaps you've had a friend of the same sex who's, who was so dear to you, so loving to you, and always was there uh, to cover you. And uh, that, that's a good thing. So chapter uh, uh, one, it's healthy to mourn and honor those who've passed. It's good to do it, uh, but also everything in good measure. The Apostle Paul says we, we mourn over those who have passed. But talking about Christians who have passed, he says we mourn, but uh, not as those who uh, have no comfort because we are not gonna be in despair. We know where they are, they know they've made it home, they have completed their journey, they're gonna be received rewards for it. So we wanna make sure that it doesn't go to the point where it becomes almost an act of worship. Uh, we don't want the passing to be one of such a strain that we can't go on with life. Uh, God wants us to continue on, it's, it's difficult, but it's important to do that. On, on, a, on a different scale, I mentioned last week that one of uh, Kelly's sons uh, had to put to sleep his dog, uh, Oreo. I think it was last Thursday. He put uh, Oreo to sleep. Uh, he grew up with Oreo. Oreo had cancer and he could not live any longer, nine years and seven months. And so last Thursday morning, we, we cried as the vet came to the uh, house and administered the, and very lovingly and compassionately administered the uh, lethal injection. Uh, and so he had to say goodbye. And he was just so torn up on Friday, he went north, buried it with his father, and, and he uh, was just mourning through Saturday and asked for scriptures, and Sunday uh, he asked his mother and she said, send him scriptures. And by Monday I noticed that he came back and he was a little more clear-headed, and I said, my, my condolences, Kevin. Um, Tuesday he seemed to be fairly normal, and Wednesday he seemed good yesterday, and then tonight, about four o'clock, I started getting pictures. Uh, he and his wife are in a pet store, and they've got this gorgeous little beagle, same uh, breed as Oreo was, and they're playing with this little thing on the floor. Don't know if he's coming home tonight or not, but he's not coming home, is he? Uh, who knows? We'll find out. But he's going through the process. Now, it takes longer, of course, probably when you lose uh, your spouse or somebody else, but there, there's a uh, kind of a microcosm of a journey of mourning. Um, Friday and Saturday, there'll never be another dog. It would be disrespectful to Oreo. Uh, then Monday and Tuesday, perhaps it'll honor Oreo to love another, and uh, who knows what's gonna happen tonight. But that's the progress, we need, we need to move forward. You gotta go forward in your steps. You can't be stuck back in the fact that my life is, just can't go on. That's not honoring God and God's plan, because we are all going to have to die and move on, and we need to be able to release the loved ones. So that's chapter one. Chapter two, David becomes Judah's king. David becomes the king after he serves for seven and a half years. Uh, and we're gonna see that uh, whenever you're about to move forward with God, uh, the devil's got another plan. And so as God's about to move his man forward to be king of Israel, 
one of Saul's sons, Ishbosheth, is set up to become king and block David. David has waited well over 20 years, and now he's got a chance to be king of Israel, and there's another hurdle. And so now Ishbosheth's going to be coming in, and then there's going to be a battle between the forces of Israel and the forces of Judah. And uh, we're going to see that step by step, uh, God is preparing uh, David to be Israel's king, but God doesn't move as you and I do. He doesn't just say here to there. It takes time. As I said, in 31 years of, of waiting for Kelly, uh, she had her journey, I'm sure, and I had my journey as well. Uh, it doesn't always go uh, uh, so smoothly. You have to just wait on God. Uh, my late mother used to use the old quote, it's not all, life's not all beer and Skittles. Who knows what beer and Skittles is? Anybody? Yeah, you, you understand, you know, because you took care of mom and dad. Uh, you, you know wine and roses, right? Well, beer and Skittles, if you were over in Ireland or, or what have you, you'd go to the local pub and you'd get a beer and you'd go out and you'd bowl on the lawn and that was called Skittles. That was fun. Go out there and drink with the, uh, with the guys at the bar and uh, go bowling. And life's not all about that in any event. So um, Christians don't use that analogy too often, I guess. But life's not always that easy, is it? And it doesn't always go in a direct line. But God's purposing, even in the so-called roadblocks, uh, to prepare us and refine us and get us ready for the assignment. Chapter 2. It happened after this that David inquired of the Lord. Oh, I love the way he inquires of the Lord. Nobody in the Bible inquires of the Lord the way David does. David is the one who taught me, through the scriptures, how to ask very particular questions about any particular thing that I had a question about. It's amazing how he does it, and God always answers him. So he had a question. Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? In other words, is it time for me to go up to Judah? That's where I'm from, the southern part around Bethlehem to start being prepared for being king. Is it time now? And the Lord said to him, go up. David said, where shall I go up? He said, to Hebron. Notice how David is not assuming anything. Don't assume. Don't assume. Ask God. He's not expecting you to figure it out for yourself. He wants to tell you what to do. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, Proverbs says, and he delights in his way. Tell me step by step, do I go to Judah? Yes. Which city do I go to? He said to Hebron. So David went up there, and his two wives also, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David brought up the men who were with him, every man with his household. He had about 600 men now, didn't he? So they dwelt there in the cities of Hebron. Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, the men of Jabesh Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. So now he is king, but not king of Israel, just the southern portion known as Judah. But again, that God is moving in stages, little by little. So now he's got a chance to act like a king, even though it's only Judah. So it's told to him that the men of Jabesh Gilead, they, they were in the tribe opposite the Jordan River on the east side. They were the ones who buried Saul. Remember how Saul's body was nailed to the wall uh, by the Philistines? And the men of Jabesh Gilead heard about it, and they traveled all night and rescued the bodies of Jonathan and, uh, and Saul and burned the bodies and took the bones and buried them. They did that because Saul had, the very first thing Saul did was protect them from their enemies. And so they remembered that kindness and they wanted to pay that to Saul and Jonathan in their death. So David heard about this. He sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and he said, you are blessed of the Lord for you have shown this kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and you have buried him. And now may the Lord show kindness and truth to you. I also will repay you this kindness because you've done this thing. So therefore, let your hands be strengthened, be valiant, for your master Saul is dead. Also the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. You have done good for Saul and Jonathan. I'll make sure we do good for you. One of the qualities of a leader is to be benevolent, is to be able to share and to care for those who will be under your control at one point or another. 
Well, he's king of Judah, <coughs> but that's not uh, king of Israel. Now the devil's got a plan, and let's see how that unfolds. But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. And he made him king over Gilead, over the Asherites, Jezreel, over Ephraim, Benjamin, and over all of Israel. So of the 12 tribes, David is over the tribe of Judah and the little tribe of Benjamin, probably. And the other 10 are now under this man, Ishbosheth. Abner is the general under Saul's army. He was a cousin of Saul. And so he's making this man Ishbosheth. No doubt he's going to be just making him as a puppet. Abner's going to want to really rule the, sh the whole scene behind the, behind the scenes. So Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old. Uh, David's about the same age. He's about 42 maybe right now. So uh, Ishbosheth's about 40 when he began to reign over Israel. He reigned two years. Only the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Now Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. So we've got a little warfare now between the tribes to the north, Israel, and Judah to the south. Joab is a nephew of David. David has a sister named Zeruiah. She has three sons, and Joab is one of them. Joab's going to become the general for David and kind of a thorn in David's side. So how do you settle this battle between Israel to the north and Judah to the south? How did they settle the battle between the Philistines and the Israelites when young David came on the scene and faced Goliath? That was very, rather than two battles or two forces going after each other, just send a champion from each one or a few from each side, let them settle it, and we'll let them determine which side wins. So that's how they did it. And uh, they all sat down by the pool of Gibeon, verse 13. They sat down one on one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. So Abner said to Joab, let the young men now arise and compete before us. And Joab said, let them arise. So they arose and went over by number, 12 from Benjamin, that's to the north, followers of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and then 12 from the servants of David. So each one grasped his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side. So they fell down together, therefore that place was called the Field of Sharp Swords, which is in Gibeon. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Send forth your 12 guys, and here are my 12 guys. Let's see what happens. Grab them by the beard, put the old sword in the stomach. They all die. That's smart, isn't it? We're much smarter now in war, aren't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> as a veteran of Vietnam, Bob was also there uh, as well. That was a smart war, wasn't it? Huh? There's no smart war. There's no smart war. Every war is stupid. Every war is disastrous. It's sad, and nobody really wins in the end in these. And I've studied military science and tactics since I was in the fifth grade in school, and it's just, it's always, it's always a bad option. Always, always, always. Well, that wasn't the end of it. So now they're, the rest of the side decide, hey, let's all get involved. And so now the forces of the north are against the forces of the south. Oh, and there was a smart war in our country, right? The Civil War, wasn't that smart? Brother against brother, and oh my golly, golly and uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So there was a fierce battle that day. Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. So David's fellow forces were beginning to win. Now the three sons of Zeruiah, those are David's nephews, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. And Asahel was as fleet of foot as a wild gazelle. He was a runner. So Asahel pursued the general Abner. And in going, he did not turn to the right or to the left. He just kept pressing down on Abner. And uh, Abner was running, and uh, Asahel's behind him, and he says, are you Asahel? He said, I am. And Abner said, turn aside to your right hand or to your left, lay hold on the young men, and take his armor for yourself. In other words, don't mess with me. <laughs> you're David's nephew. I don't want to have to kill you. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. So Abner said again to Asahel, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I face your brother Joab? 
However, he refused to turn aside, so Abner struck him in the stomach with the blunt end of the spear. So the spear came out of his back, he fell down there, and he died on the spot. So it was that as many as came to that place where Asahel fell down and died, stood still. So there's Abner, the old general, running along, and Asahel's behind him. He says, get away. He doesn't do it. Get away a second time, doesn't do it. So he says, okay, you asked for it. Takes his spear, thrusts it backwards, and it goes right through the young man, and he dies. Again, war is stupid. War is dumb. And what it's senseless in so many ways. But because we don't reason and understand and give and take, war is thrust upon us so many times. Joab and Abishai also pursued Abner, and the sun was going down when they came to the hill of Amora. It was getting late at this point. So, verse 25, the children of Benjamin gathered together behind Abner. They became a unit, took their stand on top of the hill. And Abner called to Joab, that's David's nephew and his general, Shall the sword devour forever? So now he gets some reason. Do you not know that it will be bitter in the latter end? How long will it be until you tell the people to turn, return from pursuing their brethren? So let's knock this off. And Joab said, As God lives, unless you had spoken, surely then by morning all the people would have given up pursuing their brethren. So Joab blew a trumpet. The people stood still, did not pursue Israel anymore, nor did they fight anymore. And Abner and his men went all, all night through the plain, crossed over the Jordan, went all through Bithron, and came to Mahanaim. So they finally called it off. And so whatever war you have, finally someone is able to prevail with reason. And uh, we can, in the Vietnam War, I know Bob can think about this too, we, we flew into Saigon. <laughs> I forgot the other day, I like to check the temperature on, in Saigon now and then. They automatically, Siri knows that Saigon does not exist. We fought, we gave uh, our blood, sweat, and tears to keep Saigon safe. All for nothing. All for nothing. It's not called Saigon now. What's it called? Ho Chi Minh City. Just after Ho Chi Minh of the north. So the whole thing was just a waste of thousands and thousands of lives. Lost for nothing for nothing at all. So Joab returned from pursuing Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing of David's servants, 19 men, and Asahel. But the servants of David struck down of Benjamin and Abner's men, 360 men who died. They took up Asahel, and they buried him in his father's tomb, and Joab and his men went all night, and they came back to Hebron. So that's chapter two, step by step, God is preparing David now to become king over Israel. Well, one of the troubles with war is not the war itself, but it doesn't settle anything. Those 12 men on either side didn't settle it. They all died, and then they all, both forces came at each other, and then Abner said, that's enough. And Joab said, okay, you're right. And they called it off, and they went their separate ways. But that's not going to end there either. It just continues on. And let's see what happens now in chapter 3. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. So even as bad as war is, and as senseless as war is, still some purpose is accomplished. That's a hard thing to understand. But from God's perspective, he hates to see all these people dying, but from God's perspective, he is trying to get Israel to the north under the control of David. But Satan's working the opposite way, and he's working through Abner and Ishbosheth, and um, they're not going to give it up. So warfare sometimes has to be necessary to settle the issue. And certainly you and I are to be engaging in warfare of a spiritual nature, against the forces of darkness. Ephesians 6 talks about that when the Apostle Paul says, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your argument's not with people for the most part, but with principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in high places. We battle against demonic forces. And so that kind of battle is necessary. And it goes on and on and on until the day you die. But it's necessary. And God gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. So it's a long war, 
But David's house is getting uh, stronger and stronger, and Saul's house to the north is getting weaker and weaker. And uh, meanwhile, David is busy at home. Verse 2, sons were born to David in Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon uh, by uh, Hinoam, the Jezreelitess. His second son was Chiliab, or Daniel, and that was by Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. The third is a very famous name. We're going to see it later on, Absalom. His third son is Absalom, the son of Maaka, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. So now he's got another wife. And why is he going to have another wife? In those days, they would have multiple wives because of alliances, political expediency. You don't want to have war with the nation next to you? Then you marry a relative of the head of that nation. As if it were today, let's say you had a had uh, a, uh, this kind of an economy with multiple wives. You might have a president who'd say, all right, we need to have peace with China, so I'm going to uh, talk to Cao Ping, who's got a sister, and I'll marry her. And of course, Putin is still trying to, is still the head of Russia and wants to be for the rest of his life. And so he's got a sister, let's marry Putin's sister. And we got peace with her. And then you go on with the other nations that you have trouble with. Iran, and you get the idea. That's what they were doing. Solomon would perfect this. He would have, Solomon, his son, would have 700 wives and 300 concubines who were second-rate wives. A thousand wives. He never had a battle with any nation around him. Battle inside the families, that's another story. <laughs> Sons were born to David, so we find the... This is the third son, now it's Absalom. He'll become important because he's going to try to take over his father's throne. The fourth one, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. The fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abital. The sixth, Ithrium, by David's wife, Egla. Uh, these were born in Hebron. So how many wives have we got now, Ed? Let's, we, got, we got eight? Let's start adding those up there. We must be getting eight. We've got to get eight somehow. And... Um, you got eight there yet? We got, uh, let's count them. We've got uh, Hinoam, and then you've got uh, Abigail, and then you've got uh, Maaka, that's three. The fourth one is Adonai, uh, Adonijah's mother, uh, Haggith. Fifth is Shephatiah. The sixth is uh, uh, Egla. And we're going to get a couple more wives in there before we're finished. Okay, now it was so that while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was strengthening his hold on the house of Saul. So now we're seeing why Abner, the general, wanted to put Saul's son Ishbosheth on the throne, because he wanted to really be the power behind him and make him a puppet so he could then really be the control. So Saul had a concubine, it's a second rate wife. Her name was Rispah, the daughter of Aiah. So Ishbosheth said to Abner, why have you gone into my father's concubine? So Saul had this, this concubine, her name was Ritzpah, and Abner has sex with the late Saul's concubine. And that makes Saul's son angry. Why would that make why would he be angry because the general, Abner, had sex with his late father's concubine, his second class wife? In our sense of morality, we'd say that was dad's and she was sacred and it would not be nice to, to do that to dad who's now dead. It has nothing to do with that at all. In those days, and we're going to see Absalom do this to David, if you wanted to show that you were taking over the position of Saul as king, you would go into his wives, his property, and therefore say, I claim now to take his place. And so Ishbosheth is angry because Abner is really saying, I, by going into the concubine, am taking your father's place and really pushing you aside as king. That's the issue. So Abner now became very angry at the words of Ishbosheth, and he said, Am I a dog's head that belongs to Judah? Today I shall show loyalty to the house of Saul, your father. To his brothers, his friends, I have not delivered you into the hand of King of David, and you charge me today with a fault concerning this woman. He doesn't deny it. He also has no respect for the woman, just this woman. 
She was only a chattel. She was only property to him. May God do so to Abner and more also, if I do not do for David as the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan to Beersheba. And he could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. That's it. You are angry because I have done this thing with this woman? I'm out of here. I'm now taking the whole of the northern kingdom, all that you have, and give it to David. Well, it shows that Saul knew all along, or that Abner knew all along that it belonged to David. He was not following God when he tried to take it over himself, or he gave it to Ishbosheth. But this was all God working behind the scenes to get all of Israel placed in David's hands. So Abner sent messengers on his behalf to David. Whose is the land? saying also, make your covenant with me, and indeed my hand shall be with you to bring all Israel to you. So he's saying to Abner, or Abner is saying to David, let's make a covenant. I'll give you all of Israel. And David said, good, I will make a covenant with you. But one thing I require, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michal, oh, there's number seven, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. She was the first wife. Remember Saul's daughter, Michal? And then but that Saul just gave her to somebody else, and uh, that bothered David. Well, Israel's important to me, but I still want Michal, my first wife. You bring her to me, or there's no deal. So David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife Michal, whom I betrothed to myself for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Remember that? He actually brought 200 foreskins for her. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, from Paltiel, the son of Laish. Then her husband went along with her to Bathurim, weeping behind her. And Abner said to him, go return. And he returned. So this guy is losing his wife now because David wants her back. It was his first wife. And hey, you have seven wives and that doesn't always, always meet the needs. You want to just silence my phone there, honey? Sorry. So now Abner had communicated with the elders of Israel, saying, in time past you were seeking for David to be king over you. Now then, do it. Now we're going to get closure. Abner has the authority. He says, let's crown David king of Israel. So behind all of this skullduggery, all of this flesh and all of this uh, posturing and battling, God is still working to deliver his promise to make David king over Israel. Do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and the hand of all their enemies. So he knows that David is to be the king and to give them peace over the, the enemies. Abner also spoke in the hearing of Benjamin, and Abner also went to speak in the hearing of David in Hebron, all that seemed good to Israel and the whole house of Benjamin. So it's all coming together. Abner and 20 men with him came to David at, at Hebron, and David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. So this is a peace meeting now. Abner said to David, I will arise and go and gather all Israel to my Lord the king, that they may make a covenant with you, and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. So there is the victory dinner. It's done. Now Abner says, I'm bringing all of Israel. Ishbosheth was weak. He couldn't say anything. He was just a puppet. So Abner's heading out up north to get all of Israel. God's about to have David king over the whole land. But you know, human beings are involved. And when there are human beings, there's always a problem. And behind that, there's always a devil, right? So verse 22 at that moment, the servants of David and Joab came from a raid and brought much spoil with them. So Joab was not there for this peace dinner. Remember how Joab's brother was killed by Abner? He hasn't forgotten that. He hasn't forgotten that. Because David has made peace with Abner doesn't mean that Joab has made peace with Abner. So Joab and all the troops that were with him came and they told Joab, saying, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and he sent him away, and he has gone in peace. He's thinking to himself, peace? The man who killed my brother? So Joab came to the king and said, what have you done? 
Look, Abner came to you. Why is it that you have sent him away and he has already gone? Surely you realize that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you, to know you're going out and you're coming in and to know all that you are doing. And when Joab had gone from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner who brought him back from the well of Sirah, but David did not know it. Now you're beginning to see the chemistry and the dynamics between David and his nephew Joab. Nobody speaks with such candor to David the way his nephew does. What are you doing? Don't you realize you're being deceived? They all kowtow to him. He's speaking truth to power and uh, David doesn't like it. He doesn't like it at all. He'll never get over it. Joab's always going to speak his mind, whether it's right or wrong. He'll speak his mind to David. And David may, might disagree, but David's going to be weak. He's not going to be the kind of guy that says you're fired. He'll get someone else to do the dirty work. And fast forwarding a long time into the future, when David's on his deathbed, he says there are some accounts that I want you to settle when he passes the throne to son Solomon. And one of those accounts is do Joab in. I'm not going to do it. After I go, you do it. So we're going to see that kind of a dynamic. And not one of the best qualities of, Joe, of David there. But in any event, uh, uh, Joab is strong. He is the, uh, the, the leading soldier and general for King David. And, and David needs him. So uh, verse 26, he went, after, he went out of David's presence. He sent messengers after Abner. And Abner thought he just had a peace dinner with David. And Joab wasn't there, but now Joab is wanting to come together. Well, that sounds good. Maybe there's some peace here. So verse 27, Abner returned to Hebron, and Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately, and there stabbed him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. So now David hears about this. He said, my kingdom and I are guiltless before the Lord forever of the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. He's distancing himself from this quickly. Let it rest on the head of, of uh, Joab and on all his father's house. Uh, now, it's one thing to say, this is not my doing. But here's a man who praises God, loves God, writes the most beautiful psalms, and out of that mouth comes such praise that you and I are comforted in the darkest moments of our lives. And out of that same mouth, look what's coming out. Let it rest on the head of Joab, on his father's house. Let there never fail to be in the house of Joab, one who has a discharge or is a leper, who leans on a staff or falls by the sword or who lacks bread. So, uh, Lord, I love you. I praise you. I bless you. You're beautiful. And for that guy across the street, Lord, I pray that every single descendant that he has dies young and hard and painful of cancer. Hallelujah. Love you, Jesus. Amen and amen. James talks about that. He says, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Does a well give bitter water and sweet? No. So out of your own mouth comes such praise and good things and then such garbage as well. We need to watch our mouths. David needs to watch his. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner because he had killed their brother Asahel at Gibeon in the battle. One of the qualities about David is he doesn't waste much time trying to reconcile, get Joab under his wing. He won't work with his kids to try to get them to do right. David is not really one to get a real reconciliation going. He doesn't teach, doesn't try to negotiate. He just is black and white in a lot of his dealings. So David said to Joab, so now he's going to turn it on. David said to Joab and all the people who were with him, tear your clothes, gird yourselves with sackcloth, and mourn for Abner. Oh, I'm sure Joab wanted to do that. And King David followed the coffin. They buried Abner in Hebron. The king lifted up his voice, wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. And the king sang a lament over Abner and said, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, nor your feet put in fetters. As a man falls before wicked men, so you fell. Then all the people wept over him again, and all the people came and tried to persuade David to eat uh, while it was still day. But he took an oath, saying, God, do so to me, and more also, if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. And all the people took note of it. It pleased them that uh, he would not eat anything at all. And all that he did pleased the people. And uh, <coughs> verse 38, So the king said to the servants, Do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? 
and I am weak today, though anointed king. And these men, the sons of Zeruiah, are too harsh for me. I can't stand my nephews, he's saying. The Lord shall repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. So um, David doesn't mind doing his killing. He doesn't mind killing the Amalekite for touching the anointed of God. But he doesn't understand that, uh, maybe it's not right, but uh, <coughs> one, excuse me, one, one nephew wants to uh, uh, kill Abner because he killed his brother. He doesn't understand that. He doesn't try to reason and negotiate. Uh, now he puts on a big show. Oh, Abner was so wonderful. Uh, since when was he his best friend, right? I see that in politics. I see that in life. We put on a lot of a show. Now, talking about funerals and memorial services, all of what I said is true. We go to honor, remember, mourn, and bless. But sometimes, some folks go just for show. Just for show. And make, uh, we say nice things just for show. It's politically expedient for whatever. So let's be sincere, let's be honest. Uh, I love the Bible because it's true in two senses. First of all, it's the truth of God. But it's also true in every single thing that it says uh, about people. And it's a wonderful mirror to so, show all of us our, our good points and our bad, our smooth skin and our wrinkles, uh, our, our assets and our liabilities. And we're going to see that with David. So God does not hold back at all uh, with any of this. The lesson for chapter 3 is, like all good leaders, David carefully shapes his public image. He's giving gifts to Jabesh Gilead because they were good to Saul. He's making peace with Abner because it works well for him. He wants his wife back, to be sure. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, uh, I don't think he gives two wits about Abner, except that Abner can deliver Israel to him. But then when Joab comes in and spoils that scene of peace and kills uh, Abner, David is really blown out of shape and says, may his house be cursed. He's talking about his sister's kids. May their house be cursed forever. And he believes the power of that curse as he does the power of his words to praise God. So we're going to see that uh, life is complicated and we as individuals are complicated. And the um, best thing to do is to take David's attitude about, about Saul. Don't touch the anointed. Don't, uh, the, the people can make mistakes. Pray for them. Counsel them if you need to. Rebuke them if you need to. But don't become their enemy and don't try to take them down. Uh, always be under leadership. And if you can't be under leadership, then you move on to where you, you can be comfortable. But you don't try to take leadership down. So uh, with that in mind, let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Father, we're grateful for this chance to have looked into your word. And it's interesting and it's fascinating and it's kind of complicated because we are interesting and fascinating and kind of complicated. Help us, Lord, to realize that we need to become simple and uh, not so complicated and maybe not so fascinating as we simply lead lives for Christ. Help us to give our lives to you, Lord. You are consistent. You are honest. You are pure. You are righteous. Come into our lives, Lord Jesus. Forgive us for our sins. Wash us. Cleanse us with your blood. And help us to leave, lead lives now that glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Moment your needs to supply